For some strange reason, every time I tell someone that I'm a nerd, no one is surprised by that. I don't know what it is, but one of the things that I really enjoy nerding out over is the Lord of the Rings. Big surprise, I guess. I love the movies. I love the soundtrack that goes with the movies. I love the books. I love talking about the author of the books, Tolkien, uh, studying his life. And so I wanted to share with you, I guess, a little bit. Let me nerd out for a second here. Um, One of the key uh, plot points of The Lord of the Rings is this secret king. Uh, I'm going to try and be general here if you haven't seen the movies. But there's this secret king that along the story of the movies and the books, uh, no one really knows that he's this king and nobody really likes him. He's kind of this outsider that everyone looks down on. But all the while you know, as the reader or the watcher, you know that he's coming one day to restore his kingdom. He's coming to reclaim his throne. And so you get to watch as he does this. And you get this in the books. You don't really get this as much in the movies. But one of the prophecies or poems that is applied to this king is, in the hands of the king are the hands of a healer. In the hands of the king are the hands of a healer. And so the movies, they do their best to kind of communicate this to you. But in the first one, for example, one of the main characters, his name is Frodo, he gets stabbed by some bad guys that have a poisonous blade. And this king comes along and he heals Frodo from this poisonous wound that has been done to him. And in the books, in the very last one, uh, there's this great battle that is fought. And again, the king comes and he heals many of the soldiers from some poisonous wounds that have been done to them as well. And so Tolkien, the author of these books, he picks up on this great Christian theme that good kings bring healing. They bring peace to their kingdom. Morgan and I recently have been looking back over this past year and everything that's happened, and we've said to each other frequently, this has probably been one of the worst years of our lives, to put it simply. Just to be transparent, to let you know, I guess give you a little bit of insight. Um, My parents, uh, at the beginning of this year, they went through a divorce. Our cat had to go through a life-saving surgery. Uh, Morgan and my schools, uh, just like maybe many of the the children that are in here that are going to school, we had to go from in-person to online, and that's a stressful uh, situation. I started a new job this year. Morgan did as well, which it's been a blessing to us, and we've loved it, and we've loved the people that we work with, but that can be stressful when you're starting a new job. My nana, later this year, was diagnosed with terminal cancer and died very quickly after that. So it's been, it's been a rough year, and I think that many of you could probably say the same. It's just been rough, uh, and this is all apart from COVID and everything that's been going on with that. And I don't say this, again, I don't say this to be woe is me, look at my life, it's terrible, but I say this to encourage you to say you're not alone in feeling that way. When Brian emailed me about preaching the sermon series on the different names of Jesus, the messianic names related to Christmas, and he gave me the selections, I have a very hard time choosing things just because I... I like to look at all my options is the way I see it. I say it. I, I guess, excuse it. I'm the kind of guy that when I go to Walmart, I go to the the aisle where all the chili's at, and I look at each and every little can of it, and I like to look at all the different prices and what ingredients are in there, what seasonings, and I'm just, I stress over each and every detail. I'm just not good at making choices when there's a lot of options. And so whenever I get to pick my own sermon text and Sermon title, I'm like, oh no, this is going to take a while. So I developed this whole system for choosing, and after I had done so, I won't bore you with the details, but after I had done so, I went home and I pitched the idea to Morgan. I told her, this is how I went about it and everything, and she sat there and she listened to me, and after I was done, she said, so why did you pick Prince of Peace? I was like, didn't you just hear? I gave you this whole presentation. There's this whole chart. There's this whole system. And she said, no, 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 no. You picked it because this year we've needed a Prince of Peace. 
and yeah, that's, that's the sermon in a nutshell. And so my hope today is that I, I'm just an encourager here, that I'm reminding you that Jesus is our Prince of Peace. And it's very fitting because in the, the context of this passage that we just read, it's this part of this long encouragement that Isaiah is providing to King Ahaz. Um, so just a quick history lesson. We've been studying First and Second Samuel uh, during our regular preaching time, and so we fast forward a little bit, and the king, kingdom of Israel has been split in two. We have two different kingdoms now. We have the northern tribe of Israel, or the northern part of Israel, and the southern part of Judah. And so we're specifically here with the kingdom of Judah and the king Ahaz, and who is he's not a very good king, to say the least. He's pretty faithless. He doesn't have a very strong faith in, their, in God. And as I, Isaiah comes along and is trying to encourage him, because Ahaz is afraid of foreign invaders, that people are going to come into the kingdom and take the land, take people and things like that. And so Isaiah's trying to encourage him. And Ahaz, of course, he doesn't take it very well. I don't know if you've ever tried to encourage somebody and they just turn you down. They're like, I don't want anything to do with this. But that's what Ahaz does. And so Isaiah's like, okay, speaking prophetically, uh, God speaking through him is like, okay, here's some encouragement anyways, and begins to unravel this mystery of this virgin-born son this sign that is going to be coming, and his name will be Emmanuel. And so I know that Nathan has already preached the text in the name of Emmanuel, so I'm going to come along, and this is part of it in a way. And so when we come to this text specifically, Isaiah speaks more on peace. How does this virgin-born son bring peace? And so I see this text primarily has two parts to it. In the first part, we're going to look at how Isaiah describes the kingdom of this king. And that's in verses 2 through 5. And then the second part, Isaiah describes the king of this kingdom. So as we examine the kingdom, as we look at the land that he is reigning over, we notice that there are several ways that he brings peace. So the first way is he brings peace with God. So Isaiah begins by describing a land of darkness. Notice the repetition here. People who walked in darkness, those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness. And the Hebrew word here for darkness is actually connected to the idea of death. Uh, one of the texts that we read today in our, coal, in our uh, worship guide this morning was Psalm 23. And it actually, it actually translated, translates it in this way, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It can also be translated the, the valley of deep darkness. So, Darkness is associated with death in a way here. I know that uh, a couple years ago that some of the people in this church read through Pilgrim's Progress together, and so I wanted to read a little bit of Pilgrim's Progress. It was one of my favorite childhood books, and one of my favorite chapters was his chapter on the valley of the shadow of death. So I wanted to kind of read from here to just kind of get some more from another viewpoint what a land of death and darkness looks like. He writes, I saw then in my dream, so far as this valley reached, there was on the right hand a very deep ditch. That ditch is it into which the blind have led the blind in all ages and have both there miserably perished. And again, behold, on the left hand, there was a very dangerous quag, this means a marshy or boggy place, kind of like most people think Louisiana is. Um, it's a very marshy or boggy place is on the left, into which even if a good man falls, he finds no bottom for his foot to stand on. And into that quag, King David once did fall, and had no doubt therein been smothered, had not he that is able plucked him out. King David would have been smothered had not he that is able plucked him out. So who is this person, this, this person who is able to pluck David out of this mog, this, bar, this uh, boggy place that John Bunyan is alluding to here? Well, of course, we know him to be Jesus. Jesus tells us in John 8, 12, that I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light 
of life. And that is why Isaiah talks about uh, this people who have walked in darkness. They've seen a great light. The people who are dwelling in darkness, on them a light has shone. And Jesus is this light. People who walk in, who do not know Jesus, walk in darkness. They walk about being constantly afraid of death. Spiritual darkness is an effect of sin, we know. And the Bible makes connections between darkness, sin, and death constantly. And that's why in Romans 1.21 it says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So death, sin, darkness, it's all just connected. And so this is why Jesus humbles himself and takes the form of a servant. Jesus is the only one who can create peace between man and God. This is why Romans again says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Advent, it's, it's this season in which we take time to look back We take time to look back on Jesus, on his first coming. But as we look at his first coming, we also look forward, and especially in a year like this, we look forward to when Jesus will return. And so while this is who Jesus was and who he came to be for us, he's already come to establish peace with God and man. We await a day when he will return. And so what do we do while we wait? We're still here. What do we do while we wait? So if you're a Christian, you are called by God to be an ambassador for him, to implore others to be reconciled to God. And so we need to be asking ourselves during Christmas, this is a very good time of year for doing this, to ask ourselves, who has God placed in my life that needs the light of Christ, that needs peace with God? Who in my sphere of influence does not know God? What opportunities is God giving me to share the light, life, and peace of Christ? And if you're not a Christian and you're in this room, this is a call to repentance here. That if you do not know God, you need to know him before you can have this light, life, and peace. So one last thing before I move on to my next point that may communicate how silly I can be sometimes and the things that I think, but Morgan and I, we've, we've not been married for very long, but we have yet, this is our first year, to set up Christmas decorations. We just haven't done it yet. We've typically celebrated Christmas with our families, but this year we're not going home due to circumstances, and our family is coming to see us graciously, and so we're like, oh, well, we need to decorate then. We need to set up Christmas lights. We need to set up a tree, a wreath, so she's been having probably more fun than I am about setting up all this stuff, but Whenever we set up our Christmas lights, I sat down and I just admired the Christmas lights. I just sat there and I enjoyed it. For some reason, it just made me happy. So I was just sitting there admiring it. And I sat there and I thought, wow, wait a second. We set up lights on the darkest days of the year. That's the first time I've thought of this, I guess. And so I say this to say, maybe this week you're going to go light viewing. You go, I I know that I'm going to be doing that with my family this week. Go and see the various neighborhoods and parks and places where lights are set up and just enjoy what it is. And I encourage you to remember this text here because of it. That Jesus is this light. We're, We're in the darkest time of year, of the year. Remember Jesus and that he is the one who has brought life into each and every one of your lives and how dark your life would be without him, how dark this year would be without Jesus in your life. The second thing we notice about this kingdom and Isaiah's description of it is that this king brings inner peace. So again, notice the repetition here in verse 3. The use of the word joy says, increased joy, they rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, they are glad This joy that it describes, it kind of uses these two different images. Joy at the harvest. So kind of like farmers, after they've 
they've toiled all year and then they get to the end of the year and they harvest their crops, they're happy. They're like, God has provided. We've done it. At the same time, it's like when a great victory is won. The, uh, the soldiers, they all are glad with all the different spoils of war that they are enjoying now as a consequence of uh, what God has done for them, winning this victory. It kind of reminds me of children whenever they open Christmas presents on Christmas morning. The joy that they have, the, the, you can see the twinkle in their eyes, the, the smiles on their faces. The, I know I have a little bit of joy uh, whenever I open presents. Morgan, her love language happens to be gifts. And so I see her like she's all like giddy and excited this past week. Uh, at Advice and Aid, we did a little bitty Christmas party and we gave gifts to each other. And Morgan, before I went to work that morning, she was like, oh, I'm just so excited about what you're going to get. And she, she's typically always more excited about gifts than I am. But that's, that's the joy that is being described here. Just this, this abounding joy. Let's contrast this for a second um, with the rule of King Ahaz, again, the, the recipient of this encouragement. If we study 2 Chronicles chapter 28, it tells us about the reign of this king. I just wanted to pull a few details that during his reign, over 100,000 soldiers were killed under his command. Over 200,000 women and children were taken as slaves under his command. And so King Ahaz, there's a stark contrast where instead of bringing blessing to his people, he brought curse. Instead of multiplying his people, he brought depopulation. Instead of increasing joy, he increased sorrow. And in in many ways, 2020 has been like that. It hasn't felt like it's been a year of blessing, that it's been a year of, it's been a year of sorrow in many ways. And I know, again, many of you have probably experienced similar things. Jesus tells his disciples in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives you, do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So as a follower of Jesus, we experience peace. A type of peace that really doesn't make sense. And this is why Paul writes in Philippians 4, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So this is how, in the midst of COVID, in the midst of a dark year, we can still have peace. We can still experience joy. God can protect me from COVID, even while my wife has it, so that I can better serve her and take care of her. God has saved my Nana, and so I know even though she has died, I will one day see her again. God protects our cats through the use of modern medicine, and God can bring healing to a family, even in the midst of a divorce. So Jesus brings us this inner peace. In a time when the whole world seems like it's falling apart and it doesn't make sense, It happens. But the peace we experience now, it just pales in comparison to one day the the peace that Jesus will bring in his second coming, which we look forward to. In Revelation 21, it says, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. So as we wait, like Paul tells us in Philippians, we should be praying constantly. Because that's the only way we're going to make it through what lies ahead. Some people have already been Debbie Downers, I guess, and been telling me that 2021 will be worse than this year. I'm like, please, I don't need that in my life. Get away from me. Well, you better start praying now so you can go ahead and get in the habit of it. 
in that case. But So as we continue to examine this kingdom, we've seen that this king brings peace with God, that this king brings peace, inward peace for mankind. And thirdly, he brings peace with others. In verses 4 and 5, Isaiah uses warlike language. He describes slaves that are taken as prisoners of war. Again, remember the rule of King Ahaz. The sound of loud marching boots and the blood-soaked garments of warriors. Isaiah tells of a king who will one day break the rod and staff of the slave drivers, who will burn the boots of garments of battle and garments of battle. A king who will do away with war. And speaking practically, whenever we think of the word peace, this is the sort of peace that we think of. We think of peace between man and man, between two countries. I'm an avid lover of history. Um, I sadly learned this morning that Caitlin does not share my love for history, and I kind of had to shed a tear a little bit. But uh, I love history. And as I was doing some research for this sermon, one One thing that I I love learning about is the League of Nations. So in case you don't know about that, it's after the horrific events of World War I, the nations came together. They did not want another war like this, so they came together to try and create global peace. And this group was called the League of Nations. And many historians might consider this to be a failure because World War II occurred. And even after World War II occurred, Again, the nations of the globe tried to gather together to create peace on earth, and we know this today as the United Nations. Well, as I was doing some different research for this, I noticed that an article was released in 2018 by a group called Vision of Humanity. And what they do is they they collect data for the Global Peace Index. So, okay, how much peace do we have on the world today? And the title of the article, one of the titles of the article that they released was called The World is Less Peaceful Today Than at Any Time in the Last Decade. Back in 2018, that was said. And I don't say this to be, again, to bring more bad news to the table, but I say this to remind us that Jesus is the only one who can truly create peace between man and man, between two countries in the world. When Jesus arrived in the New Testament, he declared the kingdom of God is at hand. And many people, including his disciples, thought that this kingdom was going to be an earthly kingdom, that he was coming to restore Israel to its former glory. And instead, the beautiful mystery of the church was revealed. People from every nation, not just Israel, would come together to worship God as their Lord. Through Jesus, the people within the church have peace with one another. And God uses us, God uses the church to kind of give a taste of what his future peace will be. In Colossians 3, Paul says this, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one of you has a complaint against another, forgiving one another. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. So, in many ways, though, I want to just use this again to just encourage you because I see many of you already doing this, living out this verse, living out this sermon point. Over the course of this year, Morgan and I have received many cards, many prayers, many text messages, many kind words, many gifts, people taking us out to lunch. And everything that you've done, I see as a communication of this peace, a communication of joy and loving. And we we can't express how thankful we are for that. 
I told Morgan the other day that if this year has been like walking in a dry desert, then Calvary has been like an oasis in the midst of this desert, just bringing, bringing us peace. And so all I'm calling you to do is to remember to do this. Ask yourself, who around me needs God's peace? And how can I extend that peace to them? How can I continue to love on them? So we've been studying the kingdom of this king. And we've seen that in this kingdom there's peace with God, there's inward peace, and there's peace with others. So as we turn from studying this kingdom, let's now take a moment to to think and consider how Isaiah describes the king of this kingdom. And in verse 6, Isaiah provides four just astounding names that he applies to this coming child. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah tells King Ahaz that this future king will be a wonderful counselor. The usage of this name is primarily military. It's a word that describes a brilliant military strategist, a wise person who will make plans that will never fail. The wisdom of this person will be so uncanny, so extraordinary, that it can only be explained as divine. Some of my favorite stories from the New Testament is the different showdowns that occur between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Jesus. Growing up, I watched a lot of Western movies. And so even when I use the word showdown specifically, it makes me think of the good guy versus the bad guy. They're in the street. They're faced off against one another. And you, you're like, Who, who's going to win? Who's going to win? You know it's the good guy. But you're like, who's going to win? And, and it's just all this tension. And that's sometimes how I, I feel like when I read these showdowns between Jesus and the Pharisees. What's going to happen? They've laid out this plan, this secret trick that they're trying to trick Jesus into saying one thing or saying another. And Jesus, what does he do? He wisely navigates the conversation and answers in a way that it's just, it's extraordinary. It can only be explained as divine. This future king will also be called Mighty God. Mighty, again, it's this military-like word, this connotations of a person whose sheer strength can overcome any and every enemy. Israel would use this name to praise God after they won a military battle. This future king would be so powerful that the armies of earth would be be like dust in the wind before him. One of the most powerful enemies that mankind continues to battle today is death. But we all know who defeated that enemy. Jesus in his life, death, burial, and resurrection defeated enemies that mankind could only dream of conquering. Sin, death, and Satan. So Jesus can truly be called mighty God. The future king will be called everlasting father. And so this king will be like a father. And I can't help but look back to when Brian preached from 1 Samuel, when Samuel is warning the tribes of Israel of the kings that they would have, how a king would act. He says this. This is the warning he gives them. These will be the ways of the kings who will reign over you. He will take your son and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest. He will make his implements of war, and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give them to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves." And this is how the kings of earth are defined. They take, they take, they take. 
But let's listen to the words of Jesus. Which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? But if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven good, give good gifts to those who ask him? And so while the earthly kings of, of this world are defined by taking, this king will be defined by his giving. And he shall be called everlasting, never-ending, eternal, timeless, enduring, another trait that earthly kings fail. Lastly, this king shall be called Prince of Peace. Again, to compare and contrast, while the kings of earth are plagued by foolish decision-making that leads to war, this king will be all-wise and ensure peace. While the kings of earth like power to keep their country strong, this king shall be all-powerful and sovereign in his peace. Well, every single king of the earth will die, and their kingdom will break after they're gone. This king shall never die, and his kingdom shall never end. While the kings of earth are known for their taking and their selfishness, this king shall give uh, selflessly to his subjects. And to, to God alone can we apply these titles. Only Jesus can broker peace between God and man. Only Jesus can ensure peace, inner peace to mankind. And only Jesus can create peace between man and man. So this week, as you join with your families and you celebrate, you give gifts, and everything that you do, let's contemplate these things. Who has God brought into your life that needs the light, life in Jesus, and peace of Jesus. Pray when the chaos of this life begins to weigh you down. Consider how you can bring peace to those around you and live like Jesus is the king that we just described. And sometimes that's the hardest thing to do. That in the midst of a year, when nothing seems to be planned, everything seems to be chaotic, to remember that Jesus is all wise and that he has a plan in all this. In the midst of a year when we feel like we have no control, it's difficult to remember that Jesus is all powerful and that he has control over all this. In the midst of a year when things are changing so rapidly and from one week to the next things are changing, remembering that Jesus is eternal and that he gives out of his goodness and that he's our king. That he is our Prince of Peace. It's difficult to live like that. But this is what we're called to do. To close us out, I want us to read a hymn together that, or a Christmas carol, whatever you want to call it, that is typically sung this week of Christmas. Sometimes in a Christmas Eve service it might be sung. And it employs a lot of the biblical language that we read through today that we studied today and after that we can we'll pray and we'll close out the rest of our worship service O come O come Emmanuel and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the son of God appear rejoice rejoice Emmanuel shall come to you O Israel O come, O wisdom from on high, who ordered all things mightily. To us the path of knowledge show, and teach us in its ways to go. O come, O come, great Lord of might, who to your tribes on Sinai's height, in ancient times did give the law in cloud of majesty and awe. O come, O bright and morning star, and bring us comfort from afar, dispel the shadows of the night and turn our darkness into light. O come, O King of nations, bind in one heart 
and won the hearts of all mankind. Bid all our sad divisions cease and be yourself our King of peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our Prince of Peace, that we thank you for knowing you, for that in itself is a blessing, and that in itself is how we experience this peace. God, we ask that as we leave this room, as we go about our day, that we do not neglect to apply this text, whether it be to our own lives or to the lives of others, God, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you in the midst of a year when it's difficult. We feel like Peter, who let the waves block his view of you. God, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. In Jesus' name I pray.